Walsh. Welcome to Reinventing a Genre, Pushing the Limits of Science Writing in the MIT Museum. My name is Brenda Moniappen, and I'm the Director of Programs here. And I'm thrilled to be able to host this program as part of the ninth Annual Cambridge Science Festival. We have a wonderful panel of scientists, writers, and filmmakers this evening. I don't think any one of the people up here can really be categorized as any one of those things. They are multi-talented. Um, they're going to speak about why and how to communicate science in creative ways. Tim Duchant is going to introduce the panelists and moderate the discussion, so please allow me to introduce uh, Tim very briefly. He is the senior digital editor at NOVA and editor of NOVA Next. He has an active slog per square mile. He writes for popular magazines and newspapers, and in his spare time, he has the energy to teach an advanced science writing seminar at MIT. Dr. DeChant holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in environmental science, so he is well suited to introduce this group of multi-talented science communication specialists. first female string theorist. She received her PhD from Stockholm University and was a postdoc at Harvard before returning to her hometown of Lahore, where she was a founding, founding faculty member at a new school of science and engineering. Tasneem explores scientific ideas, how we engage with them, and how they change us in her fiction, nonfiction writing, popular talks, and educational workshops for K-12 science teachers. For over a decade, she has been actively involved in science outreach, and she frequently delivers talks about theoretical physics to students and lay audiences. Tasneem has written for newspapers and magazines, both in print and online, contributed to anthologies of science writing for both adults and children, and is a regular columnist for the award-winning blog, Three Quarks Daily. Tasneem lives here in Cambridge, and she has spent the past few years working on her debut novel, Only the Longest Threads. Next to her is Amanda Gepter. She's a physics writer and author of Trespassing on Einstein's Lawn, a father, a daughter, the meaning of nothing, and the beginning of everything. I believe that father is here in the audience today. Uh, she is a consultant for New Scientist Magazine, where she previously served as a books and arts editor. Her writings appeared in Nautilus, Nova Next, Scientific American, and Nature, among others. Amanda is the co-director of New Write Boston, a collaborative workshop for scientists and writers, and co-host of Book Lab, a podcast that reviews popular science books. She was an MIT Night Science Journalism Fellow in 2012 and 13, and she studied philosophy and history of science at the London School of Economics. She lives here in Cambridge, where she's at work on a new book. And then we have Mark Levinson. Before Mark embarked on his film career, he earned a doctoral degree in theoretical part of physics from the University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears. <laughs> In the film world, he became a specialist in automated dialogue replacement, working with actors and directors in post-production to write and record additional dialogue. He worked closely with Anthony Minella, director of The English, Pat English Patient, the talented Mr. Ripley in Cold Mountain, Francis Coppola, director of The Rainmaker, Phyllis Foreman of Goya's Ghosts, Sean Penn, who, who directed The Pledge, Catherine Bigelow of K-19 The Widowmaker, and David Fincher, director of Seven and The Social Network. He is the writer, producer, and director of the narrative fiction film, Prisoner of Time, which examined the lives of former Russian dissidents, dissident artists after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and was premiered with great acclaim at the Moscow International Film Festival. Most recently, Mark directed the award-winning documentary feature, Particle Fever, which is an intimate inside look at the particle physics community on the verge of discovery of the Large Hadron Collider. And last but not least, we have Alan Lightman, who is a physicist, writer, physicist, and social entrepreneur. He was educated at Princeton and at Caltech, where he received degrees in P where he received a PhD in theoretical physics. He has received four honorary doctor doctoral degrees and has served on the faculties of Harvard and MIT. In fact, he was the first person at MIT to receive dual faculty appointments in science and in the humanities. Currently, Alan is professor of the practice of the humanities at MIT and his essays and articles have appeared in The Atlantic, Brenda, Harper's, The New, York, New Yorker, New York Review of Books, Salon, and many other publications. 
He is the author of six novels, several collections of essays, and a book-length narrative poem, as well as several books on science. His novel, Einstein's Dreams, was an international bestseller and has been the basis for dozens of independent theatrical and musical adaptations around the world. His novel, The Diagnosis, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Alan is also the founding director of the Harpswell Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to empower a new generation of women leaders in Cambodia. And with that, I think we'll let Alan start us off. Well, welcome everybody. Let me turn on the mic. Can you hear me? Is that, is that good? Yeah. Uh, very happy to see so many people here tonight uh, at the wonderful Cambridge Science Festival. Uh, so I, uh, roughly speaking, I think this panel is about um, creative ways to uh, show science, uh, the culture of science. Uh, and uh, I would compare the creative ways to uh, the standard way of, of writing about science, which is expository nonfiction writing. So that's what I'm always going to be comparing against. And of course, uh, that is an art form in itself. But I would like to be, uh, and I think most of us will be talking about um, other forms of, of presenting science uh, that are more artistic uh, novels, plays, films, uh, even sculpture. Uh, one example of, of, a, of a recent film uh, that is somewhat about science is The Imitation Game. Uh, an example of a play, a very famous play, is Copenhagen, about the, the meaning of, of Bohr and Heisenberg, two great physicists of the 20th century. And an example of a novel about science is uh, the novel Intuition by Allegra Goodman uh, about the biology lab. So these are the kinds of works uh, that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about uh, in my brief time. One of the advantages to uh, these alternative media or the, the more artistic media is that they engage the creativity and the imagination of the writer or the filmmaker. Uh, they can bring audiences to science that would not otherwise uh, read about science in unusual venues. And also they can use uh, dramatic techniques uh, such as scene setting and storytelling that you don't, don't normally find in straight expository nonfiction about science. Uh, there are some pitfalls, which I'll just mention, in uh, presenting science in these uh, artistic media. Uh, one is that you run the danger of, of inaccurate science or um, oversimplified science. Um, and we've all seen many examples of that. And the other danger that the practitioner has to avoid is didacticism. Uh, when you uh, incorporate science or the culture of science into a novel or a play or a film, the novel or the play or the film have to work first um, as an artistic work. Uh, that has to be the first concern. And if the viewer or the reader feels like they're getting uh, a physics 101 lecture, then that's the end of the game. Uh, you're, you're in the wrong medium. So um, those are the advantages, those are the pitfalls, and uh, I will turn the mic over to whoever's next. We move to more. Do I, am I, Mike, or do I use this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, you're right. So, I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, so um, the thing that uh, people almost always ask first is, how did I go from physics into film? And um, I think the, the, the thing that uh, was true for me is that at the time it actually seemed uh, rather um, uneventful. Um, I was a theoretical particle physicist and I was a graduate student and I was sitting in a room by myself um, sketching you know, with pencil and paper by myself trying to come up with a theory of the world 
the universe and um, not getting paid anything. Um, and then I actually started writing a script. And it was really the same life. I was in the room by myself writing it. <laughs> um, and I was trying to come up with a theory of the universe. And I think that was what I realized that in terms of you know, this panel, I think that for me, I, had, I did not get involved uh, in film because I wanted to talk about science. What I wanted to do was I wanted to uh, represent the world in a certain way. And, and what I realized uh, as I was finishing my degree, it was not a great time for particle theory. Um, and uh, I, I sort of discovered that there was this other thing. It was sort of this other palette of, of film and the other arts that I thought uh, were also rigorous and uh, another way of representing the world in some sense. And, and, and I, as I went on, I, I discovered a lot of other parallels that, I mean, in a sense, even in the process, the processes are, are very similar. I mean, you start with a theory um, in physics and you start with a script in film. Um, and, you know, it's some idealized conception of the world. I mean, you know, the idea of both is that you are, you're trying to come up with a simplification of the world but somehow something that in its simplicity reveals something deeper. Um, in both cases, then, you have to go out to the real world. And in, in uh, physics, you go to the experimentalists. And, and in film, you go into production. And both of them are completely different from that first phase. They're both completely crazy, insane. Uh, they cost a lot of money. They need lots of people. You're hopeful that you come out alive <laughs> and with any data. Um, and then you go into the edit room in film, or you go back to the theorists, and it's like, OK, this is the real world. And now you revise your theory. You find out you have a completely different film than you thought you had. Um, but that process is sort of similar. And uh, I think that uh, you know what, for me, was really true about in, in making this film is that I wanted to get back to that idea of you know, something that represented the truth about in this case, the way science worked. And, you know, I, uh, I mean, as Tim said, I actually was in the fiction world. I had never made a documentary before. I was in a fiction world. I was interested in telling stories. And I did think that at some point I would like to do something that um, justified starting out in physics. Uh, and then I thought it would be a fiction. I thought I would uh, write a script about some scientists or, or some scientific process. Because I don't think in the fiction world, in film, there's very good depictions of scientists either. Um, and while I was doing that, I heard about uh, this, uh, the fact that this thing was starting. And, and actually, my partner, David Kaplan, is a, is a part of the theorist who's at Hopkins. Um, and through other people, I heard that he was trying to get a film made. And these funders had turned him down because he didn't have any film experience. And he was talking about an experiment that they didn't know if it would work. They didn't know if it worked. They didn't know if it would find anything. So they thought this sounded terrible. And I immediately said, that sounds great. <laughs> Because from my perspective, I realized this actually had the potential to be a dramatic story. And that's what I think, uh, that's the way we approached it. And that was my motivation. And I think, you know, when people come up to me and ask about, you know, that they want to figure out how do you, how do you get science out? How do you make it more attractive? And it comes down to good stories. Uh, and I think that's what, you know, everybody here has realized that it's about characters, it's about people, and about dramatic stories. And in the construction of Particle Fever, that's, we actually spent most of the time just trying to deal with the dramatic structure of the story. We actually didn't put the science in until the very end. Um, you know, we always knew we could, do, we, we could do that, but we started by just working with the drama that we actually had, and we would do test screenings. And then, you know, uh, the first one we do it, and you know, and it was like, you know, a, a beam, you know, at one minute and people go, I don't understand, okay? <laughs> okay, so we need to have something here, you know? And we sort of get further and further, but our philosophy was just enough, just in time. And I think that that's something that I'm sure is gonna be a, a common theme, is that the most important thing is knowing what to leave out. And that, you, you know, we are not in the business of explaining all the physics. We're in the business of explaining why people would wanna do physics. And I think that's really the, the, the key to keep in mind in terms of you know this sort of an endeavor. Marking? Yes. So I started my career in science writing by pretending to be a science writer. Um, I was like when I was 
21 years old and my father and I have become really obsessed with like physics and questions about the ultimate nature of reality. And so I had this bright idea that I would sneak us into a big physics conference by pretending to be a, a journalist. And so I said that I was a journalist from Manhattan Magazine, which did not exist. And, um, <laughs> and, and I got two press passes, and my dad and I showed up at this conference and got to hear these like amazing physicists speak and everything. And so it was just the most amazing experience. And and I realized like that's I wanted it to keep going, and I figured I couldn't keep up with Manhattan Magazine things because someone would look it up. And, and so I started actually writing articles for Science Magazine. <laughs> and so slowly, like my fake journalism career became a real journalism career. And but the thing about this is, I think for me, because in the beginning I was like pretending to be a journalist when I would write. I was writing the way I thought journalists are supposed to write. And then I would go home at night and I would like talk to my dad about physics in just my normal voice. And I think every writer does this to some extent, especially when they start out, like you write the way you think a writer is supposed to write, not the way you would actually write. But I think for me, because I was like putting on this front, it was like even more stark in my mind that there was this difference between like the journalist me and the, the real me. And so, when I went to write my book, I decided I wanted to write in my real voice. Um, and so that was sort of like the creative challenge that I that I put to myself. And so, you know, in my real voice, like once in a while, I curse, like that happens. And so I made this very conscious choice in the book that like if I wanted to emphasize something, I might use four letter word. And, you know, not for like shock value, but just for the consistency of this this voice that I was using. And I'm always like amused because I get these emails once in a while and it's always from like old retired men and, <laughs> and they're always like, you know, I love the book and I love the content, but like did you have to use four letter words? Like, you know, people would take you more seriously if you didn't and it's like, you know, just be a little more respectful of the science and, and a little more reverent. And and my reaction to this is no, because like, I think sometimes we do more harm than good by putting science on this very formal pedestal and like only speaking in this professorial, didactic voice. And I think, you know, it just creates this distance between the reader and these scientific ideas that, that in reality, for scientists, are very intimate, passionate, artistic things. Um, and when we strip it of that, I think it like keeps people at a distance. And so the thing that I really wanted to do was diminish this distance between these ideas and, and the reader. And I think often when science writers try to do that, they do it by watering down the physics or the science. And I think that's not the right approach in my own opinion. Like I think, I think, you know, the problem is never that readers are stupid, and the problem isn't that they're not interested in content, because I think if you pick up a science book, you actually probably genuinely want to know something about science. And so, so for me, I was, like, what I wanted to do was keep the science there, but just say it in a normal voice. Um, so, so that was my challenge. And it, what comes out of that is this really weird juxtaposition of like really high level physics and this very casual voice. And so I had, you know, like reviews that are like, it's way too hard, and then reviews that are like, it's staggeringly colloquial, and <laughs> which I really want to put on the back of the paperback. Um, and, and so, but I think, you know, it's important, like, a lot of people come into science because they picked up a popular book and it like caught their imagination. And so I think when we put out science books, we should think about like, who are we inviting in and who are we leaving out? And you know, if we only have these very respectful um, ways of presenting science, I think that selects for only a certain type of person. And actually, if you look at like, the greatest physicists, they tend to be very irreverent, creative, artistic people. And so I think like, by being more creative, we can bring the type of people we really need into science. And I think that we can do it without losing the content of the science. So first of all, I just want to say, but for me, this is almost a dream come true being on this panel because um, one of the first things that got me interested in science writing was when I discovered Adam Nightman's 
uh, book, Einstein's Dreams, and you know, I was still a teenager, and for the first time, I had read something about science that that seemed to sort of mirror the way that I relate to it. So for me, I've always been, I mean, like Mark said, you know, filmmaking and physics were two things that he were, was interested in, but he didn't do one to serve the other. Um, when I was growing up, fiction was something that I was very interested in. I'd always been, you know, one of those kids who writes, and physics was also something I was interested in, but it, they were completely, you know, separate in my mind. It's not that I read a lot of science writing. I don't know if it's just because there wasn't much available when I was growing up, uh, or you know, where I was growing up uh, in Pakistan. But it's just not something I was exposed to. So in my mind, the two were, you know, two things that I liked, and there was no conflict between them. I mean, I found both of them equally beautiful in, in different ways. And what always struck me was, um, so I decided I wanted to go in for theoretical physics. And every time I would say that to someone, you know, when I was a teenager, and people start asking, well, what do you think you're going to do when you grow up, or what what do you think your major will be? And I said theoretical physics, and people would think of people, you know, I don't know, do you think, I don't know if you look the type, but <laughs> we know you're interested in, in the future. Like, why don't you just go in for that instead? And that really started to bug me because I realized that the, there was this almost like a public image problem with science where these people clearly were not objecting to the physics that I related to and that I saw. Um, because for me, it was as, you know, as beautiful as anything else. And so that's something that kind of stuck in the back of my mind throughout the time that I was doing my PhD. And it, Kind of got worse because I decided that I wanted. To, well, I don't know if I decided. I was exposed to this, you know, these sorts of ideas from the beginning. So um, I did something called string theory, which is very abstract, very mathematical. Um, you don't make anything. You don't have big labs. Like literally, you know, a paper and a pencil would be enough. A computer is nice to have, um, and that's it. That's really all you need. And you need someone to talk to because it helps to bounce your ideas off of another mind. But there's not like this huge setup that you have. There, you don't make anything at the end of the day. There's nothing you can point to. You know, I can't say that my the things that I'm working on will make a cell phone smaller or will make something fast. Like there's really nothing that I can say right now. It might end up doing a lot, but you know, decades in the future. But that's not the main motivation. That's not what I'm doing. And the you know, so I almost got to a point where I dreaded answering this question at like a dinner party or you know when you meet someone socially is like what do you do string theory can you explain what string theory is in fact you know why do you do it and every single time i was stuck because there's nothing simple that i can point to i mean you know i could go into this slightly longer explanation um and so over the years it had become like this sore point for me that these ideas which are so my problem was basically that i dealt with abstract ideas that I found absolutely fascinating. Um, pretty much the only reason you would do something like that is because you love it. You know, there's no major trade-off. Otherwise, there's no like huge financial compensation. There's no, you know. So I, I one of the things I loved about Amanda's books was that she treated theoretical physics as rock stars. It's like, yes, I get that, but you know, that's not necessarily a popular conception. Like people aren't, you know, breaking into physics conferences and things. So you don't have that. <laughs> Um, so, you know, so basically you do it because you love the ideas. And I, I got to a stage where I realized that this discrepancy was because people aren't really um, exposed to the emotions behind the ideas. So why do they not relate to abstract facts? Because abstract facts are hard to relate to, right? You, you need to put them in some kind of context. There has to be something that grounds them. And the reason that physicists are able to say, you know, oh, I love this idea, or isn't this theory absolutely gorgeous? And you know, when you talk to another practicing physicist, people are gushing over theories, or you know, they have these very strong emotional responses. And where that comes from is the fact that over the years you build up this network of associations and images and you know interpretations, and you figure out how to decode these statements. And I think. What the public is lacking is that kind of emotional connection. So if you just see something completely abstract, you just see the idea laid out, and you have no context, and you don't have the vocabulary with which to make sense of it, it has no emotional pull for you. Um, 
And so that's the reason that I turned to writing and the kind of writing that I wanted to do. So for me, it was very much, uh, I love that phrase that Alan used about the culture of science. And for me, that's what it was. Like I wanted it to be the emotions, the ideas, the engagement between a person and ideas, you know, why is that so compelling? Why are we so passionate about it? So it, it's more a relationship, really. You know, there's this idea, and there's a person, the human mind, and there's an active relationship between them. And that's what I wanted to stress, um, which is why I got into this. Um, I think that brings up a really good question. Uh, one of the things that many of you might have noticed is that many scientists do tend to shy from the limelight, or at least try to hide behind their science. They put their science in front of themselves. Uh, I prefer not to be a character, but what each of you have done in past projects, current projects, maybe even future projects, is to put a human face on that science. Um, and my question is, do we have any, you know, what do we have to gain from that, and is there anything lost in the process, potentially? Yeah, we can start down if you want to start us off. Um, what do we have to gain by putting a human face? Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, that our society, um, and of course, it, 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 it ebbs and flows depending on the uh, political party that's in power. Uh, but we, we, uh, I think that we are a little bit frightened of scientists because uh, we know that science has uh, is a major force in our lives, uh, shaping our society. Um, we know that science has, has power to do great good and great ill, uh, that it uh, is a, a language that we most of us can't read. It's a vocabulary that we don't understand. And so we, we are a little afraid of science and scientists. And I think to show science as a human activity uh, to show the uh, the ethical considerations that some scientists have, uh, to show them as people, uh, regular people that have hobbies, that have families. Um, I think that, that uh, it makes the world of science a little bit more inviting. Uh, the science itself, I think, still needs to be explained and, 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 and simplified language, but I think there's no concept of science that cannot be explained to a non-scientist. But I think the value of, of humanizing the scientists themselves is uh, in making us feel that we're all part of one human family, where we're capable of science, we're capable of art, uh, we're capable of, of of social projects, and we human beings are, have all of these dimensions, and uh, we're all part of one human family. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, like Alan says, I think there is a perception of scientists that is um, stereotypical and off-putting, and uh, that's certainly, I think, for all of us, one of the one of the important. Uh, goals was to show that they're not. Uh, when I remember in the first screenings we had, we did many test screenings with particle fever, and for sure, all the first ones, the predominant reaction was people would come up to me and say, "Wow, they're like, they're just like normal people," <laughs> and it was really sort of astonishing. Um, and it showed, you know, well, okay, good if we're getting that across, but it's sort of sad that that's what we were fighting. And I think that is really important because. Uh, there is this sense, and it can be good or bad, this, this alienation. And, and for sure, I think I was very interested in breaking down that wall and showing the, the humanity behind it. And so uh, that's what you gain by showing the, 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 the human side of it, which we all know is really true. I mean, uh, the, other, the, you know, the other thing people always ask me is, like, how many scientists did I have to go through to find six that were presentable? <laughs> And I said, well, you know, there's 10,000 on NIC, and I guarantee I didn't go through all of them. 
Um, and in fact, the problem for us was narrowing it down. The, the majority of the physicists that I know and the scientists are like the characters in, in my film. They're not, the, they're not exceptions, actually. Um, they were very good for many reasons, but it was one of the hardest problems we had on the film was cutting it down and cutting down the characters because I had started with many others. And, and I think that is really important that, that you know, there are people that you can relate to, that you understand what science does, that you understand it as a human endeavor. You understand it, like Alan said, as a connection to art and to other people that do things that you can admire as well and, and be inspired. And, and I actually wish that scientists were regarded as rock stars. I think that they should be celebrated in that way. And, um, you know, uh, Nima, one of our characters, has been approached in an airport now and asked for a little bit. And so I said, are you a cargo beaver? And, uh, and I think that would be just fantastic if that, if that continued. And, and, and it happens when it's personalized, actually. <coughs> yeah, I think, so in doing research for my book, um, Probably the most amazing experience that I had was um, I got to read through the personal journals of the physicist John Wheeler. Um, he's like the great American physicist. He coined the phrase black hole. And he's famous for a lot of work in gravity and quantum mechanics. And, and he had kept these amazing detailed journals for years and years. And so I read them and it was like, I had this experience of being inside the mind of this like, amazing guy and and to watch him struggle with ideas and sort of go in circles and, and he was so obsessive and passionate and it was like having that experience it just affected me so much because there was so much emotion in it and it's sort of like Tasneem was saying like like in order to do this you have to love it and be obsessed with it because otherwise you just wouldn't probably do the <coughs> physics and um but to, to get to experience that firsthand, I just had this entirely new appreciation for what he was doing. And it sort of reminds me of like artists, like the way you think about like a like a struggling artist that's trying to get their vision across. And like, you know, we do sort of idolize artists in that way. And we think of scientists as being like very different somehow, but it, I think it's actually remarkably similar. Um, and so I think when you can feel that passion that they have for their ideas, then not only can you understand the ideas better, but it has an effect on you, an emotional effect on you, um, that you can't get just from looking at the facts alone. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree with what everyone said so far. In fact, uh, last night there was a panel at the first Paris Church, I think, which is one of the first Cambridge Science Festival panels, and they were talking about Einstein, so it happens to be the 100th uh, anniversary of the discovery of general relativity, so you know, there are a bunch of events going on internationally that are celebrating Einstein. And there was this panel of four physicists who were speaking about him and his work. And uh, Peter Gallison was there, who's a professor uh, at Harvard, a physicist at the Ministry of Science, and he said something that, you know, reiterated pretty much everything that we've said and you know that, that I feel also. Um, he said that you know, Einstein is one of those people who's more an icon than a human being. Like you almost you know think of it as a term that like you're an Einstein or so and so is such an Einstein. So he's almost lost that um, you know that personal thing. When we think of him we think more of this huge mind that was able to grasp everything that we think of as a as a human being with feet of clay. And so um, so Peter Gallatin was talking about how when he read through Einstein's papers, he had pretty much a similar experience because he saw how Einstein struggled and had crossed out passages and rewritten words. And so you get this sense of engagement, like you get a sense of someone struggling, and that makes someone come alive in a way that looking at the finished product never does. I remember that about Particle Fever. So this was a movie that I was dying to watch for like, you know, years before. I actually remember celebrating when I found out I was playing in Cambridge. Finally. Um, and so all of the reviews, that's what they said. Like, you know, uh, I will probably misquote where it's from. It was either the scientific American or something. Someone said, you know, how it humanizes science. And there was this thing over and over again about how um, people got so engaged with the, the characters, the physicists, that by the end they were rooting for them to find the Higgs boson. So there's this emotional investment again. 
And that only comes in when you have people, like people relate to other people. It's very hard to relate to an abstract idea. Um, and that's one of the, you know, so for me, since emotion, the emotional connection was such a huge deal, that's something that you can only really gain by putting a human face on it. So that's one. And the other thing that I'm just say really quickly um, is that I also think it's very important because it gives you a sense of what science is. So for me, that's another like pet peeve, right? Science doesn't happen on its own. Like we don't put a human face on science. Like, that science is something that human beings do. It's not something that is revealed to us. Like we don't just get these laws, they don't descend from the sky perfect the way they are. But it's something we construct. And if you don't see the human element in that, if you're just given like these set of laws as if they were like decrees or commandments or you know just these absolute principles, you don't really get an appreciation for what science really is either. And I think in order for people to understand that and for science to start seeming less scary, you need to understand that it's something we're constructing. Right? So that makes it more wonderful in my opinion also because it just, you know, it's amazing that we're able to construct so much like just by the power of thought and ingenuity and, and looking around. But I think if you take people out of the picture, you completely miss out on, on that part. I think that brings up a good point, Tesney, that really Science is a process, but often the way it's delivered is in kind of a neat package format, whether that be a scientific publication or maybe the you know what you see in the media. Um, but there's really that kind of gritty tale of how it actually happened. And so how does kind of the you know, each of the works that you have done have kind of brought out that conflict and that struggle, and how do you think that um, changes the way the public views science? Go ahead and start there. Sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think uh, again, just building off of I guess where I was ending, uh, I, I do think science as a process is one of the most important insights that you know we as scientists can share with the public. I think that's one of the you know, almost greatest public service things that you can do is to show people that it's something that you're constructing, and I think that was one of the the gift almost of like Mark's film or you know Amanda's book is that you are talked through the process. Like you are able to walk through something in someone else's shoes. And so you have an appreciation for what happens. There's this uh, radio show that I love. I don't know if uh, anyone else watches it. Well, I'm sure people do radio now. Is that, yeah? Um, and there was an amazing interview by you know, the, the two co-hosts. And one of the things they did, so people were asking them, you know, how do you select what you do and um, how do you figure out how to tell the stories? And the thing with them was they said, we walk people through the process. Because once you've undergone the process yourself, it's very easy to come to a stage where you, you know, your impressions of something have changed or evolved or you've learned something. But if you're just being talked at, it's a completely different experience. So, um, and there are so many other things that are happening that you learn, which is why I think this is a very exciting time to be doing things like this. There was this um, exhibition at the Science Museum in London called Collider. And what they did was they kind of recreated CERN. So it was like a walk, you know, you had uh, offices you could walk through when you felt like you were inside the collider, so you had all these like, particles, you know, coming at you. When, so it was this really interactive exhibition. And the, the response they had was amazing. So now this thing is touring the world. And again, the, the thing that people responded to the most was they liked the chance to walk in a physicist's shoes. So all these things which traditionally were you know, off limits, and even though CERN has tours that you can take, I mean, there's a limit to how much you can you know, really be inside everything. Um, and people want that access. I mean, people want to experience things themselves and go through the process. So I, I really, cannot stress that enough. I think that's so part and parcel of the you know the character of what science is as an endeavor. And I think we do it a huge disservice when we leave that out. So for me, um, just to wrap that up, you were saying how it works and in what we do. For me, when I was writing, I realized that this is not a pedagogical thing. I mean I didn't want to there were certain ideas I wanted to, you know, get across. But there's no, it's not a textbook. I mean, there's nothing that I could do which was exhaustive or, you know, that I could explain everything. I wanted more than anything for people to get a sense of what it is that like, I'm so in love with. 
And the only way to do that is to walk them through the process, is to say, okay, look, this is what's happening in my head when I look at these things or when I think about these things. And if you walk through that with me, it kind of happens in your head also, right? When you read, that's kind of what we do, project um, ourselves into, into the characters. Um, and, and that gives you a, a feeling and an appreciation that you just wouldn't have had, I think, otherwise. Yeah, I'll just um, add to that. I guess as a non-scientist myself, like there's also the process of learning about the science. Um, and, you know, in, in typical standard science books, you know, it's, I, I think that the genre sort of emerged as like taking this idea of a professor giving a lecture to a class and just sort of like putting that into book form. So the, the you know, narrator is speaking directly to you and explaining things to you and you're sort of like the student that's like sitting and reading the book. And when I went to write my book, I just didn't feel right doing that because like I'm not a scientist, like who am I to be standing and lecturing to someone? So to me, it just made so much more sense to show my process of trying to understand all of these ideas and, and like you were saying, to sort of put the reader into my head and have them sort of struggle along with me because I think you, like when you come out of having done that, you understand it on a level that you just don't if you, all you're presented with is the end result. Um, because you just have to think it through. You understand why <laughs> that's true as opposed to some other thing, you know. And so you just understand it on a deeper level. So I think in addition to showing like the process of how scientists work, I think even the process of how like a lay person coming to understand science like can, can connect a reader to these ideas. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of I mean, the danger of personalizing, uh, I, I mean, I think the advantage of personalizing is that you make science more accessible, and I think that's something we want to do. I mean, as a process, there is a danger, of course, because um, uh, you see that it's a sloppy process sometimes, and it's not definitive, and you have to admit that science doesn't have all the answers. Uh, you have to listen to climate deniers or scientists. Um, and, and, but that is part of the process, and I, and, I, and I think that the vulnerability you get by showing the human side of it is worth the sacrifice in terms of uh, letting people understand this as a process as well. And so I, I think that that's uh, a trait that's worth having, actually. Alan, do you have any thoughts on that? I'll just say that um, I love watching any practitioner of uh, anything who has taken it to a high level. I love watching them go through their process. Um, my wife is a painter, and she made a great video about her painting process. And I'll never be a painter myself. But I was able to understand something about what goes through the mind of a painter in, in uh, creating a composition by watching this video. Um, a great lawyer, I would love to see how he or she thinks about constructing a case. Um, a great musician, and even though I'm not going to be able to do any of these things myself, to see uh, a person who is a real professional, who is really passionate about their subject, and to see their process is immensely entertaining. Um, it's a way for me to have many other lives other than the one small life that I have. And science is another great human activity. And I think for non-scientists to see how a scientist thinks about the world, um, how they struggle with an idea, struggle with an experiment to make it work, um, how they keep coming back when they're failing and trying again, uh, I think, uh, and the brilliant insights that they have along the way. Um, this is part of the pleasure, the same pleasure of seeing uh, how an artist makes a painting or how, how a, 
uh, composer makes a symphony. Now, each of you in your own way has kind of uh, taken the truth and invented to some extent, um, whether that be in your fiction film or your own in novels, and in your memoir, and you know, most of that was true, but there's probably a little, little tweaking here or there, even just out of, you know, maybe you didn't remember quite as well, or, you know, certain things obviously are going to be um, increased in importance relative to others, and then, you know, your novels will have seen. What do you see, how do you see the role of slight fictions uh, going to kind of enhance that view of the ultimate truth? Open floor. Well, I think from my perspective, uh, you know, this is a very hot topic in documentary filmmaking in general, is this issue of uh, truth and, um, um, you know, there's a trend that makes it, a lot of films now, so-called recreations, where they do things that, you know, uh, they may even have actors there. And I think for me, um, and I think for most real filmmakers, uh, you're trying to make a dramatic film. This is, uh, I mean, it's a documentary, but it's not, again, what is the purpose? The purpose for, uh, well, we decided right from the beginning with Fargo Viewer, this was not going to be the film that explains everything. There are, there's a, there is a, you know, place for that. Um, and people have done it, and, you know, Brian Green has these huge series, and uh, there's many things, uh, you know, Nova is very good at this, actually, and uh, I think there's a role for that, but as a film, as a feature filmmaker, which is the way I approached it, um, that's not what the principal concern was. I mean, what we decided was that we, Anything that's in the film is is true. I mean, we wanted the science to be true because we absolutely wanted the scientific community to get behind it. But we weren't going to explain everything. And if that meant compressing time uh, or you know moving certain things around, we had no. Well, my editor and I had no compunctions against that. And my editor um, was a very famous fiction editor, Walter Birch, who also had never done a documentary, and we had worked together and. and we had, you know, very similar ideas. It was this: what we are doing is trying to use all the tools of narrative filmmaking, um, you know, in terms of juxtaposition, timing, music, you know, sound, uh, everything that we could use that makes a fiction film uh, engaging. That was that was our tool set. And of course, we would not do something where, you know, we, we invented something that, you know, that the things may have come in the wrong place. Luckily, we didn't have to. I mean, if, in fact, if I had written the script and said that, oh, hey, they're going to first think that it's really this weird number, somebody would have said that's too contrived. And luckily, we didn't have to do that. Um, but we certainly did other things and combined uh, scenes and people and things like that to tell the story. And so, um, you know, I, I think you as an artist have to make that judgment. You know, what, what is the line that you will cross? And uh, I think, but that's the difference between being an artist uh, and being, you know, uh, a security camera, in my case, or, or just a journalist. And there's roles for both. But, you know, we all are approaching this from more as artists. And that's what we bring that's different. And that's why we try to engage people. Well, Alan, in, in, you know, in many of your works, you kind of try to put yourself in the mind of another, whether that be Einstein or a deity or something like that. How do you um, kind of grapple with that idea there? Uh, well, I, I think that every fiction writer does that. You, you have to inhabit your characters. And uh, in terms of, of, of putting fiction uh, in uh, documentaries or in uh, dramatic accounts of science or whatever, I think that you can do anything that you want to as long as you're honest with the reader and the viewer. Uh, the, uh, the most extreme example of my putting myself in the head of a character was uh, my novel, Mr. G. Uh, which the narrator is God. <laughs> uh, so that was incredibly presumptuous. What do you use liturgy? But I, I have to say that that uh, that somewhere along the, the writing of, of that book, there were moments where I did feel when I, I was putting myself in the 
Yeah. Mr. G, I felt incredibly powerful. <laughs> Construct this narrative of these like turning points, and you sort of make it into like a story that makes sense. And so, I think memoir, you're just doing that like very explicitly on the page. And I think, um, I think for most people who write memoirs, if they do sort of change the order of things or compress time or whatever it is, they're doing it um, sort of for entertainment value. For what I was doing, because like the number one thing was that this was a book about science. Um, the only times I would sort of compress time or reverse the order or something was if it made the science much more understandable. Because if you had a scene of me like learning one thing but I hadn't yet, like if it was, you know, my own process, we talk about process, it's like I think it's important to show process, but no one needs to see 17 years of torturous <laughs> process. So, you know, if I could make it like a little bit more understandable. So if there was, Something that was through my criteria it was like if the science, if, if it's going to help the reader understand the science on a much better level, then it's worth. Who cares if I change, you know, the order? I would want to speak to this person and this person or something. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're all sort of inventing our lives, so it's just a sort of strange thing to do on the page. And Tasneem, you seem to kind of do that with um, science in general, where you had a selective memory maybe in your novel about which parts of physics you were going to cover. <laughs> How did you decide which ones to choose um, and you know when to make those leaps? So that's actually a lot easier than and you know a lot less random than it seems because basically my uh, book it started out with me thinking that I would write something about string theory uh, for a general audience, and then I realized that when I start explaining string theory, there's so many little threads that tie into it. So I had to keep sort of jumping one step back, you know. If I say you're trying to unify general relativity and quantum mechanics, well then what is general relativity? What is quantum? So you know, I had to keep going back a step. And string theory is basically the search for the one ultimate theory, right? So you're trying to unify everything. And I realized that there's so many things that go into it that I could look at through the lens of unification. And to me, that's one of the things that appealed most uh, to me about string theory anyway, is the fact that it ties everything together. I just find that idea of unity very aesthetically compelling. I don't think I'm alone. I think that's a pretty you know, uh, universal uh, feeling. And so all of the, the theories that I uh, ex sort of revisited or you know the, the things that I reimagined um, all had to do with unification and they were all things that I needed to build up to die into the end. So so that's how I did that. As to the fiction, um, the reason I decided it was a very conscious choice to construct fictional characters to do this because I could have you know gone like a more semi-realistic route and looked up actual people who were living there at the time and who had thought about these theories. But I realized that I wanted, so again, like Mark said, I wanted the science to be accurate, not complete, not exhaustive, but what I said, I wanted to be able to stand by that. Um, and I didn't want to put a similar kind of emphasis also on the lives of people. And I didn't want to pick famous people or you know people who actually existed, because I really didn't want the constraint of someone saying, well, so and so was not in such and such place at this time, or you know, they couldn't have seen the statue of the Little Mermaid. It was not the, I, that was just not something I wanted to deal with. So I wanted to get the accuracy and the facts in the physics, but I wanted that freedom to play around with um, the setting and the way people were expressing uh, these ideas of how they were experienced. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions soon, so I'll start thinking about them. Uh, but I, I have one final question. Um, what do you think uh, the media, and specific, in particular science journalists, um, 
who are probably the people that the public most often interacts with when they're thinking about science. Um, what do you think they can learn from kind of the, the dramatic approaches that you've taken? I'll leave the time for the audience. <laughs> what do we think that journalists can learn? I, I think, you know, it's really the underlying theme is, is, is humanizing these sort of things, actually. And, um, you know, it was actually interesting. Uh, the, Dennis Overby is the, one of the main writers for the New York Times of Science. And um, we met him in 2008 when I was just starting. And he, he's a big fan of the LHC. He had been there, he'd been visiting it, visiting it. And he, you know, we constantly interact. And, he, you know, I tell him I'm still working on it, I'm still working on it, I'm still working on it. And, when he finally saw the film, which is only at the end, when we premiered, when it opened in New York, and and I saw him afterwards, and I said, well, you know, what, what do you think? And he said, he said, he said, it's so strange, you know, because he knew all of this, and to see somebody taking a completely different perspective was eye-opening for him. And I think that there are both, that there's roles for both parts of it, but, you know, uh, and, and I think, um, I, I think it may have influenced him in terms of some of the people, you know, looking at the people a little bit more as well. He actually, he was, a, he was very interested in, in one of our main characters, Fabiola Giannotti. Um, and I think uh, it's interesting now, whenever something comes out in physics, um, and, I, and he writes an article about it, there's certain people he goes to. And, and I think that's sort of, you know, reflecting that as well, that people are, are, uh, are realizing that that's a, a way to go. I mean, I think the best science writers, they personalize it actually as well. Um, you know, we, we have the luxury of doing it in a longer form. That's the big difference. Yeah, I guess I would say, well, I would say two things. I think one is um, short science journalists and, and having you know, done this myself, it's like, especially when you're on deadlines and you're doing story after story, you sometimes forget that like you have a choice in how you write a story. Like it's just sometimes I think people just go to the most obvious voice, the most obvious style, the most obvious narrative structure. Um, and I think for journalists just to realize, wait a minute, like what's the best way to tell the story? You know, and I, I realize people don't always have time to do that. Um, but I think I think just keeping it in mind that there are all these different ways that we can communicate science um, is a good lesson for journalists. And, and the other thing, um, which I sort of said before, is that I think I think there's this like immediate <coughs> conception that people have where they hear like creative and then somehow that means less information. Um, and I just think that's completely not true. So I think if science journalists could realize like I think they might like be resistant to doing really creative things because they're like, no, I need to get all this information across, and I think you can absolutely do that in, in very creative ways. Yeah, I think they pretty much covered everything, but um, I think that's really what it boils down to: is that if you personalize, uh, you know, the stories that you're telling, you give people more of a reason to follow along with you as you're talking through the facts. Um, I think that helps. I think making things concrete helps because just you know throwing abstract statements out there, I and mean, even if that's what came out in a press release or what someone said in a press conference, um, you need to give people a context and a way of making sense of those. And you know, stories kind of teach you how to do that because you don't talk in generalities; you always sort of quote specific things. So, um, so that helps. Um, I think it, emotional engagement helps. I think also showing process helps because that. That's also something that invites people um, in. And I think one of the, the other kind of things about fiction that every piece says when you write is, you know, there should be a conflict. There always needs to be a conflict. And that's something that I really resisted. It's like, why does everything have to be about a conflict? And at some point, I kind of figured out that, you know, it doesn't have to be this huge, big uh, conflict. It could just be something that's, you know, happening inside your own head. And, the reason I think that works, so this is not a very scientifically thought out reason, this is something that you know I came to believe in, is that that also offers us a way in. right? So we, when we look to engage with something, it's almost like if someone stops you and asks you a brain teaser or you know, some kind of weird puzzle, like this thing going around right now on the internet about 
what is Cheryl's birthday? This is one of those things where if you hear it, you know, it's impossible to not get involved in it. Like, you try and shake it off, but you can't really, and you find yourself going back to it. So, I think like, when you have a, you know, some kind of a conflict or two sides in the situation, and you're forced to take sides, that you have to choose, or you have to, or there's a problem that you need to solve. I think all of these are techniques that can draw the readers in. And I think they can just help make a piece a lot more engaging. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions that we're going to ask in the back there? So um, I'm a scientist and science blogger. And um, one of the things that seems to me is particularly uh, important about the process of science is that on the one hand, there are individual small groups of scientists doing uh, particular experiments or particular theoretical ideas. And um, their particular ideas may be reported in the press. They may, uh, uh, they, 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 they may uh, get a big splash. Uh, but what's really going across the science, of course, is that there are large groups of people. And there are, there's a competition of ideas and an attempt by the community to figure out, OK, which of these ideas is wrong, and most of them are, and which of the few which are going to emerge and survive. And so one of the other challenges of personalization and also journalism is that there tends to be a focus on the small groups and big splashy headlines or ways of sort of conveying what's happened that can emphasize that. And it's much harder, it seems to me, in this context, but it's also very important to emphasize this larger program because that's how science avoids making big mistakes, even though individuals make mistakes all the time. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the role of art, possibilities of art, uh, for trying to convey that aspect. How do you humanize a large group? Uh, I mean, well, one thing that I think uh, we made a very determined effort not to focus on the sort of standard people in art physics. Um, you know, there are, there are the, the famous names that are trotted out all the time. I think that's one of the problems that sort of gets to one of the things you're saying, too, is that you know, one of the reasons why people think it's just few is that often journalists go to the same people all the time. And so in physics and particle physics, you know, we could have focused on the founders of the standard model of particle theory. And we very much wanted uh, to focus on people that we thought were anonymous. Some of them didn't end up being anonymous uh, in terms of where they started, but um, they were not the people that are lionized that have won Nobel Prizes before the film um, or anything like that. And, and I think um, that, you know, was one, there was really a purpose to that, partly was to show that it's not just the same people, it's not just five people that developed all of physics, that it is a much larger group. Uh, now, you know, we did, we maybe were guilty, uh, hugely guilty by only focusing on six out of, you know, various people that are working on this. But I think by focusing on people that are not the most famous names that everybody all knows about is one of the re ways that you can, um, convey that sense that it's a really a bigger group effort. Okay, so the, I'm just going to quickly add to that. Um, so I kind of made a similar decision when I was writing, and you know it was a very conscious choice to write about people who were not famous. I didn't want to talk about relativity through Einstein. It had to be uh, you know, someone who was just who could have been the person next door, and I kind of wanted to tie that back to the fact that, so, you know, being a physicist myself, I mean, someone who could have been like me, a graduate student, or, you know, uh, just someone who was interested in physics. So there's this entire army out there uh, of people who live and die by these ideas, and this is their, you know, this is what they do every day, and they don't make it to the headlines. And I wanted to shine the light on that. But to come back to your original question of, um, you know, how can we convey a sense of the bigger landscape, I, I agree with you, I think that's very important because that's where the strength of science as a process comes in, right? That's why we are free to pursue our own passions is because there is a bigger system to keep us in check. Um, and why we can you know, pursue our own individual research uh, programs or whatever it is and know that these things will go through peer review. So it's not going to be completely random. Um, how we convey that to the larger public, I think, in some sense, you have to die in the context. Um, you have to just, you know, contrast whatever your own little story is against the larger landscape. I think that is very important to show that the story you're telling is not the only story that's out there. 
Um, another way that is kind of uh, maybe basic and, and simple, but that works, is to show two conflicting points of view because you know it's very hard to talk about like 20 groups, but if you talk about two who have you know different points of view, at least you give some sense of there being another opinion out there and you know one not being the only thing. But um, I agree, it's not very easy because one of the things you do when you're uh, writing is you make choices about what to crop out and what to focus in on. And there is this inherent danger of, you know, feeling like the story you're telling is the only story. But I agree, it's one of the things that makes science very um, strong is having that community. And we, we should figure out ways of, you know, of working that in. Alan, did you have something to add? Um, well, I'll just say that the point that this gentleman made is, is a very important point that uh, that individual scientists are often prejudiced and biased, uh, and the the objective nature of science comes about not from the individual but from the community of scientists critiquing each other. So the, the question is how how do you personalize science and focus on a small number of scientists? But, and yet convey the fact that, that, that the real scientific enterprise is done by the community. And I think a novel was very well suited to showing that community. And I mentioned uh, Allegra Goodman's novel, Intuition. I don't know how many people have read it. Uh, but I thought that she did a very good job of showing the, the full community in which science takes place and there were a couple of central characters that made this discovery that turned out to be uh, erroneous. And she then showed that uh, within the community of, of biologists who critiqued that discovery, found that it was erroneous. She talked about people going to conferences where they presented their work to a larger community. And so I think um, she did a very good balancing act of, of personalizing a, a, a small number of individuals and yet also showing the, the community the science takes place within. So, um, and I think that good journalists also will often uh, give you the sense of, of a community because in addition to, to interviewing the scientists who's made the claim they will interview people at other universities and other parts of the country and get their opinion. Sometimes they're critical, sometimes they don't agree. Um, they will point out flaws in the experiment. Um, and uh, I think good journalists do convey the sense of the full community, the back and forth in which science takes place. Um, but I, I, I do think it's a good point that when you are trying to personalize, you do have to worry about this, this balance. Well, I would just add that on the flip side of this, like scientists themselves are often so reluctant to talk about themselves. And, and there's this sort of like, you know, the convention in science where you write a paper and like, you speak in this royal we, right? So it's like scientists are like, have like the first person knocked out of them. And then as a journalist, when you go to interview them, sometimes it's like really funny like how resistant they are to talk about themselves because they don't want to put themselves ahead of the, the community, um, which I think is important. I think it's important that we show that there's a community, but at the same time, like what we've been saying is that you draw readers in by focusing on like individual people. And so it's, it's funny to try to get you know, there was a piece that I wrote for you Nova know, for Tim, and I was interviewing this um, scientist who worked on the bicep to gravitational wave experiment, and he was down in the South Pole, and I'm trying to get him to talk about like his experiences there, and he kept saying like, well, you know, we do this and we do that, and I'd say like, well, what was it like for you? You know, is it is it hard to be in that environment? Well, some people get um, <laughs> some people get altitude sickness. Did you get altitude sickness? <laughs> he just, I mean, he could not speak his first person. <laughs> Yes. So I'm new to science. I'm a musician and uh, I'm a new teacher. Uh, and I think the answer to my question is like your books and your movies and the Cambridge Science Festival. But I'm wondering if you guys have like 
and you know, like shining like beacon of, of resource for a new student who's interested in how you guys think about science and interested in getting kids who are at this point totally uninterested in science, uh, super psyched about it. Well, I think that in some sense that's the purpose of, of all of our efforts is to get kids interested. Uh, I mean, certainly in particle fever, um, we always hoped it would be uh, somewhat inspiring to people. And uh, I think it's uh, really one of the most gratifying things is that uh, people see it as something approachable and, and uh, they are writing to our characters. And so, uh, in, in particular, two things. First of all, there are two women that are fe featured in our film. Um, and, and that's fairly unusual in, in physics, in science in general. I mean, in fact, uh, somebody, I was having a discussion the other day with somebody, and they said, well, you know, can anybody, most people can't even name a woman scientist. The only person they can ever come up with is Marie Curie. And, you know, the fact that we have two women, and one of them was a young postdoc, and it's become very important. Uh, people are writing to her all the time. Parents would come up to me after screenings and say they want their daughters to see this film. And uh, there are people going there that are inspired to get involved in science. And I think that's, that's what we're trying to do, is to, you know, to make people uh, realize that it's accessible and they can do it. So I, I know for particle fever, I think the long term, the greatest long term um, reward will be uh, inspiring young people. Um, we've had, I mean, as young as some uh, an eight-year-old boy who went and sent us a, 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 an email. He saw the film once and he had his analysis of the film, which was just <laughs> phenomenal. And of course, he didn't get everything, but that was pretty amazing, actually. You know that he watched this film and he wrote us an email about how he thinks the you know the physics all worked out. And that's uh, you know that's just great. Yes. So to sort of address the new teacher, I'm an old teacher. I've been uh, teaching chemistry for over 20 years, but I also teach a course called Science in the Media. And I have a huge variety of students uh, of ability in that class. And so uh, I do use Tasmin's books. That's one of the books I use. But I use a, a real, uh, a bigger, the bigger picture things are okay, what's the science behind sexual attraction? And I'll tell you, all the teenagers are quite <laughs> <laughs> That's what you need to do, and it works. I'm telling you, it works all the time. So we had a, we had a speaker come in last week who was, um, I forget, she was some kind of addict. I don't know what kind of addict. So we started talking about the science of addiction, and there's so much stuff now, you know, whether it's, you know, a YouTube video or an article. I mean, you can pull them in in every way possible. I mean, there's the hot zone. You read the hot zone, which, of course, is now big again because of Ebola. And that just, you know, so you, you just, with teenagers, it's pretty easy when you, when you know what they're thinking about. Which is <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And pull them there, and then you just nab them, and they're, they're right with you. Done it for years, so have fun with it. <laughs> you know, I'll just say one more thing about that is that I also found that what really I, I actually spoke to some students in Barcelona, some young kids, and what really got them was when I emphasized a connection to art and to the pursuit. And something that Alan mentioned too that you know for some reason art seems cool, and you know artists and musicians and composers and and when you make when you get them to realize that. You know, frontier level scientific research is just like art. Um, that really engaged the kids, I have to say. It's one of those hooks. Tim, can I respond to that? Sure. Yeah. I can, I'm, I'm also going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm David Haynes. I'm the songwriter in residence with Cambridge Science Festival. You probably didn't know we had one. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been that for five years officially and more since it started, actually, effectively. Um, the biggest part of what I do is I go round all the schools in Cambridge, all the elementary and uh, middle schools, and I do around each year 50 or so songwriting workshops about writing songs about science. And um, so I have a huge watch of science songs based on the Cambridge Science Curriculum and other things, and it's just sitting there on a the shelf basically. <laughs> and uh, you know, it'd be great to find a way of using those. But we also do science 
uh, concerts in each festival. The first one is tomorrow at <laughs> 6 o'clock at the Museum of Science, and then we're doing it twice again next weekend. But that is a great way of creeping up on people, kind of by the back door and getting them interested in science. And I work with adults as well. Uh, uh, I write a huge amount of science-based material, both individual songs and choral music. And that actually was the basis of a question I was going to ask the panel, which is that in this country there's a huge contingent of people who don't accept the scientific process as being anything worthwhile, and their views of how the world works are based on belief. And is there a way of creeping up on them from behind <laughs> artistically and drawing them into the scientific process before they realise what's happened? <laughs> um, these, these people who, who don't subscribe to science, do any of them fly, fly airplanes? <laughs> yes. yes, some of them, yeah. <laughs> Well, then they're trusting in, in the laws of science. <laughs> I, I think, though, um, you know what? One of the interesting things I've found is that there's a lot of a lot of interest in science from artists, from really established artists. And I think that may be one way. You know, that I mean, it's amazing the number of <coughs> painters and, and uh, musicians and, and other people that are absolutely fascinated by the Large Hadron Collider. And then go there and start to sing about it and, and uh, write about it. And uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, again, the, the coolness of that um, is maybe a, a way of getting people to realize that, oh, these cool people are interested in this. And so maybe it's something worth looking at, too. And, and I, I, I definitely feel we're in a moment now of a lot of interest in science. There's, you know, I mean, there, there's always, there's, of course, there's a large number of people that aren't. But, um, something like, um, you know, the, the discovery of the Higgs boson really captures imagination of a lot of people. And uh, I think those are, that's, a, that's a good way to get people engaged in those sort of things. And they realize, what, you know, that this is an, an intellectual thing. It's not, they're not having to experience it as a classroom. They're seeing it in the real world, and they're seeing artists respond to it. Um, so this would be after that um, I think actually emotions are a good way to do it. It's pretty much kind of what Mark was saying just now. Because I think a lot of the times when we have objections, um, they tend to be, how should I say this? They're, I think even to have like a cognitive change, you need to have an emotional change. I mean, it's, it's almost like when someone says something that you feel contradicts your belief, you kind of just shut down. And you're not. I think appealing to reason after that isn't necessarily the way to go because people have just shut that part of their minds down. And so as to your creeping up from behind kind of thing, I think one of the, the good ways of doing that is to get them emotionally engaged before, so you're not really um, confronting their views, right? You're not calling them out, you're not making them defensive, you're not asking them to say what it is that they believe. But if you just get them engaged in a story, I don't know if you'll be able to convert people, but at the very least, there will be this conflict in their head between two things that they're emotionally invested in. At least you can do that. And I think the, you know, that's pretty much, I think, our best shot, is that before we appeal to reason, you get them engaged in the story, and then you, you know, sort of let that try and chip away at their resistance and see, like, figure out, if people are remarkably elastic in figuring ways out of things when they want to, and they're motivated, so they'll probably figure out some way to doesn't really contradict their beliefs, and you know, and they can square it if they want to. Um, but I think that's another, you know, a good technique to use. Okay. Um, this is, is for any of the panelists that feels it applies to them. Um, yeah, there are a certain number of people who can't quite grasp Yes, either that English and science are both creative enterprises or can't grab somebody who doesn't really want to be one or the other or doesn't want to pick, like, oh, you're a novelist, oh, you're a physicist. And how, and even 
any in your own head, like, oh, I have to figure out which I want to focus on and how we can deal with I don't know, those people out in the world who've encountered that think that way, even though there have been a huge number of people who have been both novelists and scientists or within yourselves. <coughs> so, maybe Mark, you want to start with that? Because I made the mistake of saying you were from Hollywood before. So, <laughs> you were from Hollywood, I'm sure that's the case. So. I, I, so, so I think the question, I don't know if everybody heard, was, as I understand it, was, you know, how, uh, you know, that uh, are you labeled one or the other, uh, and how we possibly combine it by trying to, to, you know, or can we combine them, or are we looking at them in one particular way? Is that essentially? Um, well, if you don't really want to be one or the other, how you sort of get it across to people that... Right. Well, I, I you know, for me... I guess credential. I don't, I, I don't see it as one or the other. I mean, I, what Tim's referring to is because it was funny, we were talking about this earlier, and uh, people in the physics community think of me as Hollywood film, and people in the film community think of me as a physicist. <laughs> uh, and, and, but the fact is, I don't act differently. I mean, uh, when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm working on a film, I don't, I don't feel like I put on my physicist hat or my filmmaker hat. I look at something, it's one thing. I mean, and this is, I think, what I was saying before. To me, it's a creative process. And I don't, uh, I don't personally feel I have that, too. It's just, it's part of you as a person. It's part of the way I look at things. And um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, it's more subliminal, I think, uh, that you have to find your path in, into approaching, into an, into an approach to something. And you're going to inevitably be affected by, you know, your experiences as a scientist or as a, as a filmmaker in my case. Um, but I, I don't, um, I don't know. I don't know if this is, is answering your question. I, I don't really, I don't feel that, the, that there's two labels that I have to decide one or the other. It's just, um, I'm trying to create something. I mean, what your, it's about what your objective is, and I'm trying to move people, and I'm trying to use the skills I had and the knowledge I had as a scientist. Um, as I said, this was my first documentary. In my other films, I didn't feel like I was looking at them as a scientist, and I didn't, in this case, either, um, even though it was about a scientific thing. I, I approached it the same way, actually. One more. Uh, so, you guys kind of touched on the fact that you're doing, you're telling a story about some person as a scientist or, or um, writing a story that way. You do get a lot into the details about something and you learn, you are, are really teaching somebody about that, how that person thinks. And it's kind of hard to not make, think of yourself as really talking, you know, learning, giving the, the reader something to, to take away about the subject matter. I yeah, learned more about physics and mind science dreams than two semesters of physics. Not just kidding. <laughs> not just kidding, it was the first class of the day I fell asleep with them. But you know, you, you teach somebody a lot. So if you have to think about that when you're writing your books or, or making a movie about how you're you're telling the the, the the reader or the viewer more about that subject than they might have ever had it before. So I think the question was um, as you're going through this, do you view it as kind of an educational exercise, and how do you merge that with your work? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can say for me, I I sort of had like an issue with this because because I came into science journalism wanting to learn physics myself. That was like my goal, and I was just sort of like, using this journalism thing to like to do that. And so I always felt like 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 really fraudulent towards like readers because I felt like, you know, a real journalist, like your goal should be to teach, you know, what these ideas are. And here I am, I'm just trying to teach myself. And, and the thing that I've come to realize is that the, those goals are very much aligned. Like the more you understand what you're saying as a writer, the more the reader's gonna understand it. And I think like 
often with physics writing, um, like in just traditional journalism, like people just sort of, they have to get a story out and they just sort of like parrot the common analogies and like just sort of like whatever the physicist said and they might not like have a deep understanding themselves. And, and the reader is only going to understand as much as you understand. Um, so, so yeah, I think like the teaching, I think how you internalize it also affects like whether or not you're teaching. I think we have time for one more and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, so you, you all clearly have espoused this idea that presenting with the human element is a good way to reach a wider, wider audience, and I think that's, I, I agree. Um, and it seems to me that if this was a very, very popular idea, that maybe scientific discourse would be just a more popular idea in our culture. So my question is, are, do you think that you guys are a minority in this idea of presenting science in this way? Or are you, or in, 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 I guess the, other, the second part of that is, there, is there a trend toward presenting in this way in the scientific community? I mean, I, I think that there is an interest in it, but I think what the reason it's still small is it's hard. I mean, okay. I think, you know, what everybody would realize, it's, it's hard to come up with a new approach. I mean, this was sort of the beginning of your book even, you know, is how do you tell things that are different? Than, and, and, but there is a moment. I mean, look, we have the imitation game, the theory of everything, um, cosmos. I mean, there's a lot of interest in the public about this. And they're coming at it in different ways and in different degrees of success in the scientific aspect, I think. But um, finding the, you know, committing to it and finding the right story is, is, is hard, actually. And I mean, certainly in particle fever, you know, I knew I had a general idea, but we had no idea, really, if it was going to work out or what it was going to be and if it was going to be engaging. And, uh, you know, many things came together. Uh, that uh, that worked. I mean, there's been other films about the LIC that didn't resonate, and you know, I think we were very lucky in many respects. But I think um, uh, so. I, I do think that there is an interest, and I think it's commonly accepted that you've got to do this. But it's hard. It's hard to get. I mean, if, if, in my case, I, you know, they, you know, the fiction world, you have a little more freedom. Um, I also was restricted in terms of certain things happened. Um, but in either case, I mean, you know, with, with the fiction thing, it's a, it's hard to write. It's you know, it's a it's a very difficult thing to imagine these things, and um, and with in my case, I was stuck with certain reality. But then, you know, being able to strip it out is is also something that just takes a lot of work. So I I don't think it's a mystery, but the it, it's like science. It's really hard. The details are it's in the details, and it's in just the nitty gritty of doing it. I'll just make one short comment. Uh, and that is, I don't think that it's necessary that all scientists explain their work to the public. Uh, I think it's fine if a certain fraction of scientists just buckle down <laughs> and, you know, and discover the next gene that will cure cancer. <laughs> Uh, I think that's perfectly fine, uh, but it is extremely important that, that some scientists and science writers do speak to the public uh, because uh, we live in a democracy and the public needs to be informed, uh, not only informed, but it's, it's great if they can appreciate the culture of the science and understand scientists as people. That doesn't require that all scientists do that, but just some. Uh, and I think that we're all very lucky that the people on this panel are doing that. Just say super quick. Um, I think, like, as a genre, science writing is relatively very new um, compared to pretty much any other genre. And so, like, I think we've recently reached this point of not quite saturation, but there's a point where suddenly, like, if you want to book on quantum mechanics, there's many books on quantum mechanics. Like, so, so it's getting to a point where this sort of really standard thing has been done, and I think now people can start to, like, open up and do more creative things and, and branch out, and I think it's, like, a really exciting time because, you know, the field is so, so young, and so it's exciting to see what people will do. 
so uh, really quickly, um, I am actually very hopeful about it. I do think it is a bit of a trend. I don't think it's this huge sort of tidal wave that's taking anything over, but uh, I do see more and more of it. And I was very encouraged by that personally because when I you know, came up with how I wanted to write my book, it seemed like something that, you know, that was just personal to me. I wasn't sure how many people it would resonate with. But then when I started looking for it, I discovered there were so many other books that had you know, sort of circle around similar issues. Um, and I think there's an increasing number of them in recent years. So for me, it started with uh, Jana Levin, who's an astrophysicist at Columbia uh, at Bernard College. And she wrote this diary called How the Universe Got Its Spots. And that was something that became very popular, that she wrote uh, A Bad Man Dreams of Turing Machines, which was fiction about uh, Adam, uh, Al Turing and uh, Kurt Goodell. So, you know, there was her, I found her, and then you sort of find people through other people. Recently, I think in the past year alone, there have been um, people at, who was it, there was like Edward Frankel wrote a book, Max Denmark wrote a book, um, you know, these are professors of, of maths or, or physics. Uh, I tend to know more about them just because that's my field. Um, but there's E. O. Wilson, who's um, you know, a biologist at Harvard. He's written uh, a bunch of books about, like, for the popular audience, but he's also written this novel called Ant Hill. So when you start looking for them, it just seems to me like, yes, there have been isolated times in history when people have done things like this before, but, you know, you'll find, like, two or three novels that I'm aware of in, say, the 30s or 40s. And then now it just seems like those data points are coming a lot closer together. And I think partly it has to do also with the fact that when people respond to it positively and you see that it's working, more people are willing to make that effort because it is a huge effort to make. But I do think it's a trend that's you know that's catching on. At least it's gaining momentum. Is what I think. Well, I think that's a very hopeful note to end on. So uh, please join me in uh, thanking our. Report.